Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jennifer Hammondy, and I'm a board member with the National Transportation Safety Board. With me today is member Tom Chapman, also with the NTSB, and uh, our NTSB investigator in charge, Bill English. Oh, wrong side. Bill is here. Member Chapman is here. I wanted to give you an update of what we accomplished today. Uh, I spent most of the day on the accident site. A lot of our investigators were on scene continuing to examine and document the wreckage. We also looked for uh, the significant components like actuators and gearboxes to make sure that they all arrived with the helicopter on scene and we were able to verify that. We also mentioned yesterday that the pilot had an iPad with four flight on it, so we were looking for electronic devices as we always do. We were able to recover an iPad and a cell phone. We do not know if that's the pilot's iPad. So we're going to take those uh, personal electronic devices, we're gonna send them back to our lab at headquarters for further analysis. We also located maintenance records in the wreckage. We are not, we can't discuss, uh, we're not gonna discuss the maintenance records because we haven't looked at those. We found them, we documented them, that will, become, that will come later. We found the airworthiness certificate, the registration, the company's operating manual, weight and balance sheets, and everything we would expect would be on the aircraft. We also uh, worked with drones today to help the airworthiness group locate those significant components and continue to document the scene. And then we duplicated part of the flight path. So we flew part of the, the end part of the flight path with our drones use, using ADSB data. Recovery operations occurred on scene today. A recovery crew was loading the wreckage in uh, large white tarp bags which were airlifted by helicopter from the scene and loaded on a truck and will be moved to a secure location. The, uh, that has already occurred, uh, so it, the, that is on the truck and ready to go. So we have turned the site officially over to local authorities. We are done on, on the site. Some of our accident investigators began interviews today. We interview, we're working on interviews with air traffic control and we had interviews with the operator. I don't have any information to share with you at this time about those interviews, because those interviews are ongoing and we haven't been able to connect. They are working on setting up other interviews for the next several days. At 3 p.m., I held a family briefing by conference call. We do that with every accident investigation. Either we hold a family briefing uh, to update them on the investigation, make sure they're aware of information before we provide it publicly, and um, go through the process, the NTSB's investigative process, and what they can expect over the next several weeks and months. I'm not going to discuss the family briefing. You're going to ask, if, if I get questions about who was on the call, what was discussed, I'm not going to answer that out of respect for the families. I am gonna provide you some information for some questions that were asked yesterday and the day before and over the past couple hours. With respect to the pilot, I mentioned that on the second class medical certificate, which was dated July 2019, the pilot had 8,200 hours of flight time. Obviously that was July, so the pilot has more flight time because it's been some time since then. Out of that, the pilot had 1,250 hours of flight time on the S-76 heli helicopter. So 1,250 hours on the helicopter. So that's a good amount of experience. He's also been with the company for 10 years. 
We do know that the day before the accident, he flew from John Wayne Airport to Camarillo, and uh, the weather was clear. It was a different flight path, more direct, and occurred about an hour later than the one on Sunday. I was asked about the descent rate of the helicopter. We know that the helicopter was at 2,300 feet when it lost communications with air traffic control. The descent rate for the helicopter was over 2,000 feet a minute. So we know that this was a high energy impact crash. As the, and the helicopter was in a descending left bank. Now, one thing I want to mention is some of our recommendations. In 10 days, we're going to issue a preliminary report. That is going to contain factual information. It's not going to contain our findings, our analysis. It's not going to contain any safety recommendations or a probable cause, but it's going to provide some factual information, more than we have now, but just the facts. In about 12 to 18 months, well, we hope to have a final report, which will include findings, recommendations, and a probable cause. In that time, we could issue urgent safety recommendations. So at the end, when we issue a final report, we issue safety recommendations that we hope will be implemented by the recipients. And the goal is to prevent a similar accident from happening again. Two recommendations that have been issued in the past that the FAA has failed to act on, I want to talk, out, talk about. I was asked about Terrain Awareness and Warning System, or TAWS, which provides terrain information to the pilot. I was asked whether that was on this helicopter. We have verified it was not. In 2004, the NTSB investigated a crash involving an S-76A in Galveston, Texas, which killed 10 people. We issued a recommendation to the Federal Aviation Administration that stated, require all existing and new US registered turbine-powered rotorcraft certificated for six or more passenger seats to be equipped with a terrain awareness and warning system. They did not implement the recommendation. In 2014, we closed the recommendation as unacceptable. In 2005, we assisted in, in an investigation involving an S-76C helicopter, which crashed in the Baltic Sea, killing 12 people. We issued a recommendation to the Federal Aviation Administration to require all rotor craft operating under parts 91 and 135 to be equipped with a CVR and an FDR. The FAA failed to implement that recommendation, so we closed that unacceptable. And for this accident, it was operating under part 135 charter. So with that, I want to state this is the last press conference that we're going to have. We are not leaving the scene. Our investigators still have work to do. We, again, will provide a preliminary report in 10 days that will, that will contain factual information. We'll have a final report in 12 to 18 months, and again, we could issue urgent safety recommendations in that time. For investigative updates, please monitor our Twitter feed at NTSB underscore newsroom. And of course, feel free to contact us if you have additional questions. I'm going to take some questions. And uh, please raise your hand, state your name, and your affiliation. Thank you. So, 
Yes, you're, you're correct. They have a Part 135 VFR certificate as to how the instruments were maintained and if they were kept to IFR standards. That's something we'll be looking into in the maintenance records. We haven't got that far yet. But is the fact that they were classified that way, is that part of the investigation? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I don't have information on the passenger manifest for Saturday, uh, but it, it, the crash site was 1,085 feet. There were other hills in the area, so they, but the impact area is at 1,085 feet. How much did they miss clearing that mountain by? How much did they clear missing the mountain by? I mean, do we need? Oh, yeah, 20 feet, 30 feet. Maybe 20, 30 feet. Over here. The question was on the weather inf uh, the weather information we requ uh, and the question is specific to uh, information we requested from the public photos and videos that were sent in to witness at ntsb.gov and whether we've been able to analyze any of those we do we are in the process of looking through all the photos and videos I will state th a big thank you to the public every time we ask for information you send it in and it's very helpful to our investigation. With that said, we have received video and photos that are not of this helicopter or even in this country. So I will state that takes our investigators time to verify that and that takes away from the investigative work that they need to do. So while I do appreciate a lot of what we received and a majority of what we received is fantastic, but in other areas, it, it does waste our investigators' time. Jennifer, Tom. Tom Costello with NBC News. You mentioned that Taz was not on board this chopper, but did the chopper have some sort of a derivative of Taz, or some poor man's Taz that may have linked GPS into some sort of a, a terrain avoidance system? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, you're asking if the uh, aircraft had some any type of GPS-based uh, terrain avoidance system. Uh, again, as mentioned, we're going to be going through all the equipage that's on the aircraft so that we can understand that. That'll be part of developing the sequence. Right now, that doesn't look to be uh, part of the scenario that we're looking at, but we'll definitely be documenting all of the equipment that's on board, certified or not. Well, well, I mean, we'll have to see what's on the iPad. I mean, we don't, we don't know right now. That's part of any investigation. I'm sorry, let me repeat the question. And the question is, what sort of information do we hope to glean from the iPad? There, there could be a lot of information on the iPad with respect to terrain, weather briefings that uh, the pilot may have gotten, notice to airmen, um, flight path information. We'll have to look at all of that but I, I'm not sure we have any of that yet. So that's something we have to analyze and we've sent that information back, or uh, the electronics back to our lab. The uh, question is, did we, well, first on, did we locate all the significant components? Yes, so that would seem to, that indicates to us, preliminary information is that the helicopter was in one piece when it impacted the terrain. Uh, the second question is, was the helicopter crash survivable? No, was the dive recoverable? Was the, di oh, was the dive recoverable? Yes. I mean, that, that we're going to have to look at as part of the accident investigation. That requires further analysis. So, so they, if we could just follow up on that, you mentioned the 2,000 feet per minute descent rate. 
is that within the normal operating range for that helicopter, or is that considered an out of control situation? Is that a normal descent range for uh, for this for this for this Sikorsky? I mean, this is a, a pretty steep descent at high speed. So it wouldn't be a normal landing speed. Is that beyond the realm of the helicopter to handle? Does the flight control still work? Does the, does the pitch still control that helicopter? That's something we're going to have. Uh, can, can the helicopter handle this? And that's something we're going to have to evaluate as part of the investigation. Steve. I mean, how do we determine pilot judgment? That's a difficult part of the investigation, and we look at the facts in the investigation, and, we're, and that's what we're focused on. We can't make any assumptions about what somebody is thinking. So our investigation is strictly focused on the facts, and then those facts will lead us to an analysis. And what type of facts are you trying to provide? Uh, I'll come back to that. Stephanie. Oh, uh, the the question is, what did the drone? What did we learn from the drone from the uh, flight path information that we uh, put in the drone today? I mean, we were looking at the flight path, so the angle it took coming in. We didn't fly it low because that would be a problem, and there were people. Uh, working in that area, so we just wanted to look at part of the flight path, and uh, and we want to docu document the wreckage with it. You had a second question uh, on the, the 20 to 30 feet that I just mentioned. The question is on the 20 to 30 feet. Somebody just asked uh, where the impact site was. It was 1,085 feet uh, uh, up, and uh, he asked uh, where the, uh, what the height of the hill was, and it was about 20, 30 feet above that. The helicopter just missed clearing the hill. I mean, what? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I, the, the question was how, how much did the helicopter miss the hill? It's important to realize that there's not one hill. It's a ravine yeah. with undulating terrain, so the small outcropping that had the main impact in it the main impact was about 20 to 30 feet from the top of that small hill, but there are actually other higher hills surrounding it, if that makes sense to you. It's in this canyon with small hills within it. There's other hills right close by, correct? Well, yes. I, and I don't, I don't know that we can say it probably would have hit another hill either. I mean, that's just, that's an assumption, so we can't state that. Hey. Uh, the question is on the grounding of the LA Sheriff's helicopters uh, that, mo that, that morning. And it is an apples to oranges comparison. It's a different helicopter, different operations. They have four person helicopter. This is, this is outfitted for, for more than that. So, you know, we have to look at this specific crash and, we, and this specific helicopter. We can't compare that to others. Is there any way to safely fly this helicopter in thick fog? I mean, I think there's a lot of variabilities there. And so we're focused on what the weather conditions were uh, for this, uh, on, on Sunday for this flight. And uh, we have a uh, weather expert on staff currently looking at uh, the weather and decision making for flying in the weather that day. Question is how common it is for a pilot to request to fly under special visual flight rules? It's very common. This is not out, out of the ordinary. Uh, 
the, the question is on the terrain warning. It didn't have a terrain warning and awareness system, so no. It did, it did not have that. Um, the, the, what was your first question? Why would the helicopter go up to 2,000 feet and then go down to 1,700 feet? He was trying to climb it. Go right, ahead. He, was he was trying to climb out of the cl cloud layer at the time. So, yes. No. Uh, the question is, if our recommendations were implemented, would this crash not have happened? Well, certainly TAWS could have helped to provide information to the pilot on what terrain uh, the, f the pilot was flying in. But one of those recommendations on the helicopter having a CVR and an FDR that would have helped us significantly in this investigation and other investigations. And it's something we've recommended several times uh, over a number of years, so. The question is, in what, at what point would TAWS have alerted the pilot? There's many variables here and we don't even have a conclusion that TAWS and this scenario are related to each other. So that's a lot of speculation in that question. So that, that really can't be answered. Is it too soon to say whether or not the pilot was still in control of the helicopter when it started that abrupt descent? Uh, that it is too soon uh, to state whether the helicopter was still in control or the pilot was still in control of the helicopter at that point. Is that consistent with controlled flight? What you what we're seeing? Is what consistent? The, the question is, uh, does the bank and descent um, sound like controlled flight? Um, that would be asking us to draw a conclusion at this point, and until we put together all the information, we can't make that kind of conclusion. Uh, well, I mean, we're going to look, what evidence do we look at um, to help make the determination of whether he should have been flying in this kind of weather? Well, we are going to look at the weather conditions. We're going to talk to air traffic control. We're going to talk to the company. And uh, we're going to look at records. So. From, from the descent? <coughs> the time from the descent to impact was probably about a minute. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you.